hoping that most of our attendees are here with us. Um, and a big welcome to you all. Um, we had over 350 people signing up for our event. I hope most of you are here. I'm very excited to see so many people interested in um, our event today. Um, a wee bit firstly about who, who we are um, as EHRC, for those of you who, who don't know us. We are Britain's Equality Regulator and one of its four human rights institutions. Um, we share our mandate in Scotland with the Scottish Human Rights Commission and our sister organisation, who we work very closely with. Um, and we are grateful for their uh, interest in our uh, event today. Um, why the event that we have? Um, I suppose we all um, have for a while had an interest in how uh, justice was being performed, if you like, in Scotland. Um, there have been more and more of a move towards virtual courts um, even before the COVID era, but obviously the, the space that we're in now, we see even more of that um, with uh, virtual court summary trials um, starting and indeed a three-day commercial proof in the court session um, very recently. And a lot of the tribunals especially have been moving to teleconferencing, video conferencing um, and some distance um, courts um, over the last uh, little while. Why are remote hearings a, a rights issue, I guess, is a question. Uh, why is the Commission particularly interested in this? Obviously, there are equality issues, especially around um, uh, reasonable adjustments being made to these new systems. Uh, and whether they are actually available for disabled people or older people, especially. Um, this move to sort of remote hearings requires IT technology as well as these reasonable adjustments. Um, there are also clear human rights um, issues um, at play, and particularly around um, effective participation um, in the court's processes. Um, so, do the people who are uh, joining remotely understand the system that they're in? Are they able to follow um, what the courts are doing? Can they instruct their own lawyers effectively um, in these kind of settings? And can they present their cases if they are um, unrepresented? And these might be particularly uh, difficult in, for example, children's type hearings or um, in mental health tribunal um, hearings where we've seen uh, difficulties arise. Um, but overall, generally, I think these are very important issues um, for those trying to take part in, in remote courts. The Commission actually carried out a criminal justice inquiry very recently, looking particularly at the experience of disabled accused people in the criminal justice system. Um, a piece of work actually that we did um, last year and reported on just within the last few weeks, um, again, sort of pre-COVID era, but, but very uh, pertinent, I think, for today's times. Um, and we were looking at whether the needs of disabled uh, accused uh, were being identified, which I think is a, is a huge um, hurdle that we found, as well as then adjustments being made um, to accommodate um, their needs. And again, whether they were actually able to fully participate in their uh, criminal trials. And we basically found um, that, that a lot of time they, they weren't. Um, uh, these criminal trials were not fully um, being participated in by the persons uh, who were accused. Um, the need for reasonable adjustments was not often thought about. Solicitors and others in the process were not able always to identify um, that an individual needed um, adjustments to be made for them. Um, and, and overall, um, the system does not work particularly effectively. Um, and then when you add remote hearings on top of that, um, it can become even more um, difficult. Um, so as we uh, were finding, this is a in, in normal uh, day court um, systems, we have now moved into uh, uh, even more use, I guess, um, around uh, remote hearings. Um, and that's really what prompted us to, to have today's um, event. Um, I think it's an area, it would seem certainly from the numbers of you who are attending with us, that it's an area that is of uh, great interest, um, not only in Scotland, but, but in, in other jurisdictions as well. So we've pulled together what I hope is a really good um, group of speakers for you um, today. 
Um, and we're going to start um, um, our speakers with uh, John Scott QC, who many of you, um, I'm sure, will, will know well. Uh, John qualified as a solicitor a time ago. I'm not going to say how many years <laughs> that is in his bio. Um, uh, and was a partner in uh, Gofeder and McInnes, um, uh, uh, I mean, the criminal uh, firm in Edinburgh. Obtained rights of audience in the High Court in 2001 and took still in 2011. Um, since then, um, obviously, John has been involved in a number of very complex and high profile cases um, developing um, Scots law um, uh, over the years. Um, he's a part time advocate, deputy president of the Society of Solicitor Advocates, um, and many of you will know him as the chair of the uh, new major independent review into mental health here in Scotland, um, as well as now leading the independent advisory group, group looking at the use by Police Scotland of their emergency powers in the coronavirus, uh, coronavirus um, crisis. Um, he was formerly convener of the Howard League for Penal Reform in Scotland until uh, 2018 um, and chaired the Scottish Human Rights Centre um, from 1997 to 2005. So, a huge amount of experience to um, provide to us today. Um, John, can I uh, hand over to you? Of course. Thanks very much, Lynn. Can you hear me okay? Um, I certainly can. I hope others can too. Thank you. Um, well, I was delighted to be asked to uh, contribute today. I had read the ERC feedback here maybe because of my headphones. Apologies, Maria is in twice. Maria, I'm going to have to ask you to um, go back out again. You're causing a loop in our system. I'm very sorry. Frank will email you separately, but you, I'll need to ask you to leave. My apologies, Maria. <laughs> Sorry, John. Carry on. Okay, no, no, no problem at all. Um, yeah, I, I, I uh, um, had seen the report when it came out. Um, I had contributed some evidence to uh, to the, the work of the HRC uh, while it was looking at the Scotland, and it, it is an area that has been of interest to me for for some time in a number of different capacities. Um, I mean, remote hearings and the risks and opportunities. There is what one risk is that we think that remote remote courts are better than no courts. And to an extent that is true. But unfortunately, now it's been driving things. Uh, and I think without uh, really any consideration being given to the parties, to the accused, uh, and in particular to uh, vulnerable accused uh, um, or those with uh, with learning disabilities or the like, um, and having to wound the the system as it adapts to a new dealing with its work and the the massive backlog that has built up. One thing that I noticed from an early stage in my career was that uh, for a lot of lawyers, the courts and the court cases were really about them uh, and the, their clients, the accused person, parties were really secondary to what mattered for them. Uh, and that was so to the extent that there's one uh, prominent QC who decided that it was really up to him whether an accused person had evidence or not. Uh, and you know he he made no secret the fact that he regarded it as his decision, and that that had never struck me even as a young lawyer as being the way it was supposed to to work. There's a risk of that within the profession that we we start thinking of cases as being about about us uh, rather than about the people that we are they are representing. Um, and it's also struck me for quite a while that those with disabilities uh, or vulnerabilities are fairly poorly catered for within the system, and that's for a variety of reasons. And Lynn mentioned possibly the main one, uh, uh, certainly the, the first one that comes to mind, which is just awareness. Uh, lawyers being aware or asking the question to make themselves aware of sometimes hidden disabilities uh, or a, a recent, relatively recent appeal case where someone had Alzheimer's and dementia and uh, although there had been a, a small red flag, 
no expert reports were instructed on that, and the, the, the man went through a whole trial, was convicted, and the conviction was eventually quashed on the basis that uh, he should never have been taken to trial in the first place because of his Alzheimer's. Um, so I think as a profession, we are not very good at picking up on uh, vulnerabilities in our clients. And partly that is because of the vast number of people that we deal with who have got vulnerabilities. So we start with a different baseline than the, the mainstream population. Um, when someone else comes in with addiction issues, with mental health problems, we've seen it so many times before that do we stop seeing it? And that's a risk. Uh, and it's in particular a risk for uh, the many in the profession who are dealing with a large number of cases, and in particular on the legal aid side, where the way to, uh, to continue to earn a living is through doing a large number of cases and therefore being able to spend the amount of time with each client that, that would be preferable and that would allow you perhaps just to get to know them and to work out if they had uh, vulnerabilities uh, or hidden disabilities or the like. And the other thing is, I suppose, we're not trained in it. There has been a level of training for the police who are frontline responders in a lot of the situations, obviously, the, the, those that end up in court. Um, but at, as a profession, we've not really had had any, uh, and that uh, runs a number of, of risks. Um, so that there's uh, many uh, vulnerabilities that slip through uh, the, the net that p people who are no doubt now serving prison sentences um, who, for whom adjustments should have been made uh, during the course of the proceedings just to make sure that they were able to follow and participate fully. But without that really having been given any proper thought, we have vulnerable witness applications. Uh, they're fairly common, but very, very rarely do we see vulnerable accused applications. And that's the thing that I, I said I would, I would focus on mainly today. Now, the Law Society of Scotland has done some work on that, and there was a report on the vulnerable accused in April 2019, and then continuing work under Debbie Wilson, the convener of the Criminal Law Committee, and that's ongoing. Um, and also the Lord Justice Clark, uh, just before lockdown, uh, set up a group to look at the, the, the position of the vulnerable accused. So there's, there's perhaps a level of awareness that's percolating into the system now, which is good, um, but it needs to happen very quickly. Um, and we need to learn from other jurisdictions which are further ahead us in terms of dealing with all sorts of vulnerabilities and participation, proper participation in court. And for example, the use in England and elsewhere of registered intermediaries. Now, of course, we don't have any in Scotland at all. In England, although they've got them, they don't have enough to uh, cater for accused people. So uh, the, if people are going to be prosecuted, if the state thinks that the, it's important enough, whatever they're accused of doing, to, to take it to court, then it's important enough to try and deal with the whole thing properly uh, and to assess, as the EHRC report suggests, assess individuals and their ability and their capacity uh, to make sure that uh, reasonable adjustments are made uh, and whether that is standard measures like regular breaks or the like, or something else entirely. Uh, the system is not really geared up uh, for it, and I think along the way a lot of vulnerable or disabled people have uh, have been trampled uh, uh, by the court's need and desire to get through the business. Um, one of the, the things that um, opened my eyes and, and widened my perspective was uh, being senior counsel to the main survivors group at the Scottish Child Abuse Inquiry. And that is a properly trauma-informed uh, inquiry. All the inquiry members, from Lady Smith through to the lawyers that are taking statements, have been uh, trained in trauma-informed trauma practice. Uh, and you can see that in action. So that the, uh, for example, one witness who gave evidence was allowed to was was able to have a, a small pram in front of her that had two Yorkshire Terriers, and and that enabled her to give her evidence uh, through recollections of the, the trauma. There has been use of live links, in particular, where there have been witnesses in uh, Australia was the, the most recent example. And that's worked reasonably well, but I, I think it probably lulls us into a false sense of security. 
uh, because while there's been lots of reports on the use of remote hearings, where the system as it was didn't really properly acknowledge and respect uh, some of the difficulties that people had, with remote hearings it's even more potentially going to be about just getting through things and, and trying to deal with the backlog. Because some of the feedback from the early remote hearings in England was that the parties didn't, didn't think it was good at all. There's some evidence that suggests an accused person will be dealt with more harshly if it's not uh, in a face-to-face -face encounter with the judge. Um, now, while, for example, in sentence appeals in Scotland, for some time, the accused has been, the appellant has been uh, on a, a live TV link, um, and, and that was accepted by appellants on the basis that they didn't want the disruption that being carted off in the prison van and then having to wait around for hours and then waiting for everyone else to finish their appeals and then be taken back and missing their visits. But on the other hand, it, my impression is that there's not the same participation in it. They don't feel that it's about them. It's just like watching a tell. They may well drift off. And since lockdown, I've had the experience of I've done one remote hearing. Now, the, the person I was representing in that was a, a retired former diplomat. Uh, and so the, he was able to to uh, take part to the extent that he, that he wanted, basically just watching it. It, um, it wasn't uh, an evidential hearing or the like. Uh, but I've had some consultations with people in prison where I've been on the other end of a mobile phone and the TV link has been between the solicitor's office and the accused person in prison. So there's someone I'm representing on a charge of murder now, and I've never seen him face to face. Uh, and th there is no connection. I I'm two screens away from him. Uh, and the good thing is that he's had a long-standing relationship with the solicitor. So that bridges that that two screen gap, but it's it's very, very far from satisfactory. And especially as the system's made it clear we're going to uh, uh, adjust to using uh, remote hearings for far more things, for custody appearances, uh, for trials, for other evidential hearings in the, in the summary courts. Um, we need to make sure that that acknowledges some of the things that are uh, explained in the EHRC report and that actually we take the time to make sure that the most important people in cases, which is not the lawyers and it's not the judges, it's the parties, it's the accused person, it's the, the witnesses, it's the complainers, uh, that they are able to fully and properly participate. And if that means that we need to do bespoke assessments in individual cases, if that means we need to have better training on awareness for lawyers, for police officers, for others, then that's something that we should simply do. Because if it's important enough to prosecute the, the cases and the, the more serious the cases, the, the more this is true. If it's important enough to prosecute the cases, then it's important enough to, to make absolutely sure, or as sure as we can be, that the, the person at the heart of it is able to participate as fully as possible. Uh, so I'll leave it at, at that uh, just now. Thanks, Lynn. Great. Thanks very much for that, um, John. Uh, very interesting. I should have said before John had started that um, we're going to take questions in the panel at the end. Please do um, leave us your questions in the chat function um, on the uh, right of your screen. Um, on the buttons at the bottom of your screen, um, you'll have a uh, far right, there's an X for leaving. Please don't do that. Um, but uh, not the next, but the one after uh, button is your chat button. It's like a little quote um, uh, mark. Thank you again, John, um, for that. Can we move on now to um, our next speaker, Sarah Craig? Um, Sarah is a senior lecturer in public law um, at the University of Glasgow, um, has published extensively on asylum and immigration in Scotland, including recent work on interpretation, translation, and the di digitalization of immigration tribunals. Um, she developed an interest in access to justice, immigration and asylum, law and social welfare law early in her career, um, working as a solicitor in law centres, which is where I first know Sarah from. Uh, we both worked in law centres many years ago. <laughs> um, and that's where her, her research interests uh, lie. She's also a member of the Glasgow Refugee Asylum and Migration Network. Um, and Sarah's going to look a bit um, at the remote hearings in immigration. Thanks, Sarah. 
Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Lynn. It's nice always to see you in this context and to be reminded of the days in law centres many years ago. Again, I won't say how many. Um, I'm going to talk about remote hearings in immigration. Um, in particular, I've been asked to offer some insights into the use of interpreters in video link hearings at immigration tribunals. And I'm going to draw particularly on um, observations at 89 bail hearings at the Immigration Appeals uh, cha Chamber First Year Tribunal in Glasgow between October and December 2015, which was a project I was involved in at that time. But um, it's not just about immigration bail hearings, but about immigration hearings more widely that I hope my um, insights will relate to because um, remote hearings have become the thing now and in immigration hearings particularly they have. It was, I, it was also good to see the insights that came from the criminal, um, you know, the report from the Human Rights Commission, because there were so many parallels with what um, we found in immigration hearings. We found immigration hearings by video link can lead to disconnection and separation from people and the legal process. And there were many barriers to participation in immigration bail hearings that we observed. They included, for example, the fact that the bail applicant is at the remote location and the interpreter, along with all the other participants, is in the hearing room. So in that sense, they weren't fully remote. The only person that was remote was the bail applicant themselves. And um, I, you know, among other things, this provided a, a, a lack of opportunities to, to prepare, pre-hearing consultations, um, over video link were often inadequate um, because um, the bail summary arrived late and you know there was just this brief moment when the um, applicant and their lawyer could speak to each other there was this loss of what's called co-presence in by some researchers you know the, the the not being there with 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 the others which which john has has talked about as well there's also the imbalance between the parties, between the individual and the Home Office, that people feel in immigration appeals that is clearly magnified when you're the one that's not there and um, you're the one at the remote location. There are often technical glitches, and I think this is um, particularly a problem. The Immigration Tribunal has used video links for a long time. Um, chari Well-known charities such as Bail for Immigration Detainees first reported on this way back in 2010. So this is, gives, gives you an in, indication of how long these, these hearings have been around. And, and the connection is not very good. Um, there are often technical glitches. In For just one little observation to make about the um, observations, we, the RBL observation project, at one point one of the judges said, uh, well, the picture's terribly blurred. And the Home Office presenting officer, officer said, oh, it's been like that for quite a while. And the clerk said, yeah. And they went on. You know, so, you know, I think not to over, it, it's so important that the technology works well. But to poor communication with the interpreter obviously causes important information to be missed. It can mean that the bail applicant only understands some or sometimes even none of what the judge is saying during a hearing. Um, it can mean that parts of the process are not translated. We certainly found that, that, that most of the time the interpreter might be um, translating what some of the parties said, but not, not so much what others were saying and generally didn't seem to translate sufficiently. And there were actually two cases that we observed out of the 80, where the, where the only words that were translated was bail refused. So what are the risks? Well, there are many, but in relation to interpretation specifically, the applicant or appellant can suspect that the interpreter is not on their side. Um, and this has implications, obvious implications for communication. Um, but equally, judges and deci decision makers may struggle with the role of the interpreter. Um, it's been observed that interpreters, well, obviously depend on other parties' assistance. People speaking at a slower rate or slower pace, um, making sure that turn taking is observed that they're given their space and people don't talk over each other and problems with turn taking can be particularly um, emphasized during um, remote hearings. So it's about giving, making sure that the interpreters have space and confidence to interrupt, seek clarification and, and so on. 
So that's in relation to interpreters, but more generally, to go back to my introductory remarks, there's the issue of disengagement by the, the applicant. And I mentioned Bail for Immigration Detainees, that charity. They wrote a report in 2012 where, among other things, they talked about the hope and despair that the experience can result in applicants just not applying for bail. And I think there's one particularly telling case that they expanded on this. It's a case called VC, which, which you may be aware of from 2018. It was um, a court of appeal case where the Home Office's failure to make reasonable adjustments for a mentally disabled immigration detainee was held to be a breach of the Equalities Act. They could have provided what they called a litigation friend, and they, they didn't. And the um, courts remarked that immigration detention was particularly problematic because there was no, at that time, there was no automatic review and it depended on the applicant taking the initiative and applying for bail. And um, there isn't really time to go into here the whole problems around the lack of a time limit for um, immigration detention in the UK, which has been well documented on human rights grounds. There is now an automatic review of immigration detention after three months. But um, the problem where people just feel like there's no point in applying is definitely um, an issue. And the remoteness has to be part of that, I would say. Now, having said all that, very negative, there is there are opportunities. And to return first to the use of interpreters, given that remote hearings is where we are, the interpreter's complex and active role within the process could be understood and acknowledged more clearly. The hearing structure could allow time for the interpreter to interrupt and seek clarification, as I mentioned earlier. I think one important thing to mention is, and this has been mentioned by American researchers, is that um, audio recording technology could be used to capture what is said at hearings. And this could have many purposes. It could be used to check from its translation. Now, you may say this is over the top in a bail hearing, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But for example, the Public Law Project, who has done a lot of work, particularly um, down south regarding remote hearings, has recommended that all remote hearings for monitoring purposes should be recorded because you know, otherwise we're going to end up in a position where, as John said, it becomes a default because it's efficient and quick and kind of works from the institutional perspective. And here again, I think there's an opportunity which, which, I'm, you know, which is important to bring out that to bring out the differences between tribunals and courts and the differences between types of hearing within each forum and acknowledge them and uh, that to take a nuanced approach. And here, you know, I'll, I'll acknowledge that people say participation doesn't matter in bail hearings. It's just a risk assessment. What are you going on about? Well, I, and obviously I would say, well, actually, when it comes to things like risks of absconding and so on, the, the, you know, the person's evidence is important and there is a measure of credibility in there. But equally, when it comes to issues like supporters of the person being detained who may be able to provide a bail address, and they may be giving evidence, and that's important too, and that gives uh, credibility rises there. But in the immigration, just to briefly mention other areas where the role of credibility is acknowledged, um, such as human rights appeal hearings, we now have a situation where these full hearings are potentially also done by video link, where the what's called the deport first, appeal later regime applies. And this is the regime whereby it originally applied to um, foreign national former offenders who could be um, deported before they were um, heard. And therefore, you know, obviously the appeal hearing would be by video link. And we now have guidance from the Supreme Court in the Chiari and Bindloss cases that said that um, if an appeal right from abroad is not effective in relation to a person's Article 8 rights, then the in-country appeal should be available. That was an important judgment. It did say it depended on whether the, you know, the, the need for oral evidence would make a difference to the proportionality assessment. I don't have time to go into that. But nonetheless, I suppose the point I'm making is you could almost see the bail hearings as a thin end of the wedge, and that was prior to COVID. So we now have it you know, much more entrenched uh, or potentially entrenched in immigration and adding another layer 
in relation to that that process in terms of accessibility. I think I've only got about a minute or so still allowed in my time, and I was asked by Frank to say what my one ask would be, and it's kind of an obvious one in this setting, and it is that to use technology to protect the applicant or appellant's rights, and not only to promote institutional efficiency. And, and I think that needs to be thought about in a, in a nuanced way, and I invite you to do the same. So just in relation to bail hearings, I'll say a couple of things. Address the loss of co-presence. So you could actually co-locate the interpreter with the applicant in a bail hearing scenario. You might, you know, in, a, in the, the hearing centre, where, sorry, the removal centre where the individual is being held is secure, and you could have the interpreter there without losing too much control of what's going on. You could do that, I would suggest. You could even have the legal rep there, but that might <laughs> be difficult too. Nonetheless, it's worth thinking about, I think. And the other thing is to enable, for example, the witnesses for um, applicants' sureties. In, our, in the research we did, very often the supporters of the bail applicant um, lived in England or elsewhere, even though the applicant was being detained in Dungable. And it was hugely difficult for them to come to the hearing centre. So you should be using technology to assist people. If they're just saying, I'm about providing a bail address, why not let them take part by video link? Use it for them and not just for the institution. But ultimately, communication is key in so many, in all these processes. And so where it's compromised, and I would suggest when you're using interpretation, you know, it potentially is compromised. Don't have remote hearings as a default. And certainly in bail hearings, that we observed 80% plus were by, were remote and it was the default. So please, you know, learn from this and take things from it, but don't use it always as the as the future. <laughs> thank you. And thank you, Lynn, for um, and Frank for inviting me to come along. Oh, not at all. Thank you very much. Um, so that's very interesting. And yeah, I can see how interpretation certainly adds yet another layer of <laughs> horror to some of this stuff. Um, thank you for that. Uh, again, uh, any questions um, in relation to what Sarah said, please add them to our, our chat list. Um, our next speaker was to be Maria, but I think she has still not managed to get in and stay with us. So if it's okay, me, may, um, may I move to you early? <laughs> I hope that's not a difficulty for you. Um, may Dunsmuir, many of you may know, is the President of the Health and Education Chamber of the First Year Tribunal um, for the Health and yeah, the Tribunal for Scotland, the Health and Education Chamber. May was appointed um, President of the Additional Support Needs Tribunals um, in 2014 and became the President um, of the Health and Education Chamber in 2018 uh, when the ASNTS transferred into that uh, particular chamber. Uh, qualified solicitor with a background in children's hearings. Um, and May was a convener with the ASNTS since 2010. She was also formerly in the in-house convener with the Mental Health Tribunal for Scotland and a lead convener for child and adolescent mental health tribunals. Um, so May has some um, very direct ability to uh, deal with the issues of remote hearings, um, as she's having to do at the moment. Um, and it'll be very interesting to hear um, how that's going for you. Thank you, May. Thank you very much. The risk of um, remote hearings is that you sit back thinking you've got a lot more time before you have to um, But I'm glad to be speaking to you today. I want to cover this by looking at from two perspectives, well, making two particular points. First of all, uh, an access to justice point, and secondly, an effective um, participation perspective. So looking first at access to justice, what do I mean by that? Well, I, I thought it would be quite helpful to look at this from a circumstantial per circumstances perspective and then look at it from the person's perspective. I, I wanted to start by emphasising in terms of circumstances that a decision on the type of hearing that will be uh, conducted, certainly in a tribunal perspective, and I'm speaking uh, to you this afternoon about the additional support needs jurisdiction, although I'm going to refer to one or two other tribunals in the course of this. But a decision on the type of hearing will be a judicial decision. It's not an administrative decision, and that's important 
because the decision will be taken after considering the facts and circumstances of each case, including the preference of the parties, and particularly in my jurisdiction, the preference of uh, the child, uh, where one of those parties is a, a, a child party. It's not a case of one size fits all. Uh, and when we consider access to justice, we need to remember that access covers all aspects of justice. It's not um, just about what happens at the hearing and what the decision is. It's for me uh, the beginning to the end of the process. In its fullest sense, it's about the person experiencing throughout an environment of independence, impartiality, integrity, propriety, uh, equality, competence and diligence. And some of you may recognise these as the Bangalore principles, which guide all Scottish judiciary in their decisions. Now, those principles are set uh, in the statement of principles. Uh, sorry, I'm get, are you managing to hear me OK? Oh, I just got a wee message there. I'm going to assume you're hearing me OK. Um, those principles are set in the statement of principles, uh, which it is hoped that members of the public can take comfort from from the knowledge and expectation that judicial decision makers will be making decisions in the context of those principles. But looking at what we're faced with at the moment, all physical uh, tribunal hearings in Scotland were postponed from the beginning of lockdown. And some jurisdictions, like the Mental Health Tribunal and the Additional Sport Needs Tribunal, have been using telephone uh, conference hearings, although the Additional Sport Needs uh, jurisdiction is only using these for time critical hearings. In most tribunals, uh, there are options in terms of how evidence is taken, and there are options in terms of how a hearing will be conducted. The options at the moment are. Um, for a telephone conference hearing, for a video conference hearing, or for a decision to be taken on the written evidence that's without an oral hearing. The thing that's been taken away from us at this moment in time is the loss of the physical hearing. Uh, and that's what's prompting this afternoon's debate and much debate that's been going on since the beginning of lockdown. While we cannot use what we think is the most preferred option, uh, that's the physical hearing. We simply can't wait this out. Uh, justice must be fair, it must be efficient, and it must be, in some cases, expeditious. Now, when I say about the physical hearing, uh, when I say we think, I, I, I'm saying that simply because we don't really know. Uh, it may, be, may well be that we discover there's a preference towards video or telephone hearings that we've been unaware of because we simply haven't tapped into those as options uh, for uh, the additional support needs jurisdiction. The remote style of hearing may be revealed to offer benefits for the future, and it might not just be a vehicle to manage cases during the pandemic. But uh, just to reassure, one of the points that Sarah was making, I certainly don't see remote hearings as becoming a default, certainly not for the Health and Education uh, Chamber. Tribunals will usually have the option to take evidence using telephone or video link, and some use telephone conference for pre-hearing judicial case management. So the concepts aren't new to us. What is new is the use of these for the end-to-end -end tribunal hearing. This is not something that we're used to employing. We have not conducted a review of the tribunal experience in Scotland to match the recent um, EH, uh, the Equality and Human Rights uh, report into the criminal justice system or that of the Civil Justice Council um, conducted by Dr Natalie Byram. But we are collecting views across the jurisdictions about the remote hearing experience. And uh, to date, that's involved telephone hearings. Uh, for Scottish tribunals. However, from July, a video platform will be tested by my own chamber in the additional support needs jurisdiction, and we'll be looking at the use of Cisco WebEx, which we're using this afternoon, and which has had some success in the Scottish courts. So that's the circumstances. If, if that's the circumstances, then what about the person? 
In the additional support needs jurisdiction, we see children who have profound, complex and multiple health conditions. The majority will have one or more disabilities and many have autism. The Scottish justice system is appropriately concerned to prevent children such as those being uh, exposed to judicial proceedings. However, in our experience, this does not necessarily reflect the felt position of our children who may themselves wish to be given an opportunity to be heard in their own hearing and in the fashion they choose. And to my mind, access to justice means quite literally moving uh, heaven and earth to allow those who are the subject of the proceedings who want to participate to be able to participate and to use any means possible. In the additional support needs jurisdiction, I say anything is possible which is possible. And I've given a commitment to children that I'll listen and learn directly from them. And, and this has actually led to some of the most important child led innovations in the additional support needs jurisdiction since its inception in 2005. And that includes the introduction of new sensory hearing suites, physical hearing uh, suites. And uh, I, I mentioned this because learning directly from children is far from forward. And when I say direct, I mean face to face in person. Uh, and doing that using a range of different means. And the children that I've listened to have influenced the minor and the major aspects of, of the innovations that we've been involved in. And I mention it here because listening and learning contact with and this has identified better routes to participation. So if we're to maximize our learning potential from this pandemic and we'll have to listen. It's worth mentioning that when asking them what a hearing room and what a hearing environment should look and feel like, I asked them the question, do you want to come to a hearing? And all of the children who I listened to said yes. What they didn't want was to come to what hearing had looked and felt like for them in the past. They wanted something better. And so we went on to create something better and we launched it on the 25th of February a few short weeks before lockdown, and now I find myself having to identify a suitable alternative in this new sterile environment in which we live. Despite the challenges, though, it remains crucial that justice is felt, experienced, done and seen to be done. For this to happen, it's my view that the environment and the atmosphere of the remote hearing must continue to promote effective participation. The UN describe access to justice as a basic principle of the rule of law. In the absence of access to justice, people are unable to have their voice heard, exercise their rights, challenge discrimination, or hold decision makers accountable. And Lord Newberger, president, former president of the Supreme Court in 2017, said that while much of the responsibility for ensuring access to justice lies with the government, it's not just the government, and he's talking there about the legislature, it's not just the government which should be expected to facilitate access to justice. Lawyers and judges have an equal duty. And he goes on to say it would be quite wrong for me to give the impression that lawyers and judges can get away with standing on the sidelines and criticising. They have a heavy duty to do all they can to support and improve access to justice for ordinary citizens. Now, before I move on to effective participation, I'm only going to very briefly touch on um, the CRPD and CRC because I expect Maria Galli will want to talk about the CRC. But just a reminder that Article 13 of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability um, uh, tells us that state parties have to ensure effective access to justice for persons with disabilities on an equal basis with others. And Article 12 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child reminds us of the right of children to express their views and their right to be heard in any judicial proceedings. So, in all of our preparations for remote hearings and the additional support needs jurisdiction, we keep a close eye on those two particular conventions. So, what should effective participation look like? 
And I'd like, I'd love to have a visual aid for you here. I've decided not to use any PowerPoint slides in case it uh, corrupts anything. But I would commend HARP's ladder of participation, which was introduced to me fairly recently. And it talks about the different levels of participation. So you can Google that uh, later. But effective participation, from our perspective, uh, looks like something uh, like the following. First of all, the child or young person or whoever that may be, well be, whether that's as John described, vulnerable accused or, or others, but the child or the young person must remain at the centre of the proceedings. And we have to see the proceedings through their lens, not our own lens. We need to take account of the fact that a remote hearing would be taking place potentially in the child's home. And as reports have already uh, highlighted, we must guard against invasion whilst recognising that taking the hearing to the child might actually work better for some children. The SEND, the uh, equivalent of my jurisdiction in England, who as of last Tuesday have now conducted over a thousand video conference hearings uh, since lockdown, have noticed that more children and young people are are actually attending video hearings, and some of them have been seen dancing in, in, in the background. Uh, they seem quite comfortable using their phones or tablet when joining the, the video conference hearing. Secondly, sensory hearing principles continue to apply. And for that to apply, that means the absence of the unnecessary. There needs to be uh, uh, less background clutter uh, and very little uh, noise. We need to give a choice of the type of hearing, whether that's telephone, video, or no oral hearing, but a paper hearing. And we have to acknowledge, as the uh, EHCR report picks up, that uh, video hearing might not be suitable for people who need support with uh, communication, particularly with poor connections. Third, justice must be felt to be taking place. In other words, it has to be emphasised that the remote hearing is not a lesser form of justice. Justice also needs easy external access. We must make sure that the necessary technology is available in the child's home. Uh, I don't know how many different VC platforms you've used during lockdown. My poor computer and my weedy brain learns one kind only to discover another and useful a week. And justice needs clarity and understanding. But there needs to be reassurance throughout the hearing and an emphasis on the quality of the process. We must also make the request for a physical hearing, and if a case isn't time critical, then we have to take that very much into account. Fourth, the overriding objective always applies, and in the tribunal that means equality of arms, efficiency and expediency, uh, taking decisions without delays as far as possible. I want to quote Lord Carloway in his recent report on this. He says the cry of its I been cannot prevail. We have to seize the momentum and opportunity to respond to the particular challenge. The reward of having a new, vibrant, progressive, digitally enabled courts and tribunal service may just be within our grasp. As I said earlier, we simply cannot wait this out. Children need decisions about, in my jurisdiction, which school they're about to attend. Uh, transitions to primary and secondary schools need to be managed, and allegations of discrimination shouldn't have to wait to be tested. Guidance must also be clear and accessible. And finally, we need to keep learning from practice and from experience. In one of uh, my own uh, cases, I actually heard by telephone, not by video link, because we haven't started the video link. Uh, sorry, video conference just yet. The tribunal members reflected that despite some of the challenges, the positives um, were actually uh, uh, even more striking. They managed in two days to hear the evidence of eight witnesses without any delays. They managed to hear a time critical case and reach a decision on the matter at the end of that. So, to conclude, uh, we must work hard to earn the trust of those at the centre of our proceedings. They must experience and feel justice despite the remote hearing. They mustn't be left with the impression that this is a secondary version. They must feel and experience effective participation. Uh, and as I say, in the additional support needs jurisdiction, we must wrap the system around the child and not wrap the child around the system. 
These are very early days. I think we might stumble at times, but I think we've got a strong Scottish will and tenacity. The remote hearing is not, in my view, a system to replace physical hearings, but it's a system potentially to sit alongside physical hearings. It's an answer at this point in time, because we quite simply can't have physical hearings. But um, it could be an option for the future. So I'm going to end now with uh, an air of optimism rather than pessimism. And I'm confident, I hope, uh, that we will prevail. Thanks very much, uh, me. And I like ending in a spirit of order. Excellent. excellent. Um, I think we still haven't managed to get much and an awful lot of. No, I think that's better. Thank you. Um, so uh, yeah, we can't get her in at all. Um, I'm really sad to say, um, but we do have uh, with us our last speaker for today, who is Catherine Smith. Um, Catherine's been standing junior counsel to the Advocate General um, since 2012, um, and is on the EHRC panel of counsel. Has been since 2015. Um, she was also appointed an ad hoc de advocate deputy in 2017. She has a strong commitment to promoting the rule of law and human rights and has participated in a number of international conferences um, and worked with foreign legislatures. Catherine is a founding member and the deputy chair of Justice Scotland, um, which is the, the reason we have her here specifically today. Uh, the Scottish arm of the London-based NGO, as most of you probably know, and is also co-founder and chair of the John Smith Centre for Public Service, based at the University of Glasgow. Uh, can I hand over to you, Catherine? Thank you very much, and um, thank you for having me. Um, so, yeah, I'm here with my Justice Scotland hat on as vice chair, and um, to talk about work that Justice in England have been doing on virtual trials. Um, they've been trialing out doing a full criminal trial um, remotely um, using volunteers. Um, and I'm pleased to say that um, I will hopefully be giving, broadly speaking, um, an upbeat message as well, like our last speaker ended with. Um, it is a broadly positive story to tell and some really interesting and encouraging um, findings from it and, and potential opportunities for the future. Um, so I just want to really give an update um, on how it went um, and maybe just make some suggestions um, for opportunities um, uh, and, and highlight some risks, but I'm going to focus more on opportunities. Um, so Justice have now run four um, virtual criminal trials using volunteers, just to be clear, they weren't real trials. Um, they used a jury of 12, they had witnesses, um, lawyers and judges. Um, they were mostly drawn from uh, justices membership so they did include professionals and the judges and the lawyers were real judges and real lawyers um uh, mostly counsel um in the first two everyone was in a separate location um including all the jurors they attended from home but in the second two trials they had jury hubs uh, and they brought the uh, jurors together in a physical space in london um in a civic space and socially distanced them and provided them with the facility to uh, join the trial from one room, um, which the assessment ultimately has been that that was a much um, more successful format than the jurors joining individually, um, principally because you then eliminate 12 possible technical problems down to one, um, because you're only needing one feed. Um, the, the process has been evaluated by two academics um, who specialise in the field of court design and effective court participation um, and are specialists in, in people's experience of the justice system and they have produced a report on um, following each trial. Um, it's not been an academic exercise though, um, the purpose of trialling these is to uh, seek to find out whether or not they can be a real solution to the backlog which is mounting in both Scotland and in England um, in terms of criminal trials. Um, and it's partly also to address the calls that there have been for judge-only trials, um, which has been an issue um, north and south of the border. Um, and uh, Justice Scotland produced a response to the Scottish Government's um, suggestions 
um, about this, saying that it should be absolutely regarded as a, a measure of last resort. Um, and in our view, virtual trials ought to be um, considered. And if um, if it's found necessary to eliminate them, they should be eliminated first, um, rather than going to a judge only trial. Um, the Justice Secretary, Robert Buckland, QC MP, gave evidence to the Justice Committee of the House of Commons last week, thanking Justice for their trials and saying that he's more in favour of it than he would have been prior to seeing the work. Um, so it is um, firmly on the agenda down south. Um, and indeed, our uh, Professor James Chalmers, Regis Professor of Law at Glasgow University, um, who is a, a long-standing friend of Justice Scotland, had made it clear to us that he was very sceptical about whether or not such a thing could be a success. So we invited him to participate in one of them, um, and he completely changed his view. So broadly speaking, we'd say that the experience of those who participated in the trials um, or who viewed them um, were very positive about it. And many of them had come with um, deep scepticism about whether or not it could work or be effective. So it, it really is a story of converting people's views about whether or not it's a viable way forward. Um, and certainly um, from justice's perspective, um, whilst we don't say it's necessarily perfect yet, um, it's um, it's certainly a viable option in our in our opinion. Um, so I thought I would highlight a few of the findings um, from the evaluation reports that might be relevant to the discussion that we're having at this event. Um, I think it's important to be clear about what it is and what it isn't, and, and this touches on some of the comments from the earlier speakers, um, particularly um, about the immigration bail hearings. Um, this was a format where everyone is appearing virtually. Everyone is on the screen. And that is tangibly different from a situation where only one person is appearing, um, whether it's um, uh, an asylum seeker or um, in the immigration tribunal or an accused person. Um, and all those feelings of being marginalised um, are, are not the same in this format. It's a much more equal format. Um, and that was a really important um, finding from it, particularly from the perspective of the accused. Um, one of the other takeaways we would say is very important is that if you're trialling something like this, and I think one of the other speakers has made this point, it's really important to evaluate every trial. It's important to continually seek to refine the process and to learn lessons. Another finding was that um, participations need really good preparation prior to it. They need to understand what's going to happen. Now, the court system, to a certain extent, recognises this now, and a lot more support is provided to lay people attending court. Um, and it's, it's equally true um, in this format. So justice prepared videos for participants to watch that told them about what to expect, but also about their what they should expect their particular experience within it to be. Um, and really, we take the view that if you're going to do it properly, there has to be a way to guide people really from the entrance to the virtual court building right to the courtroom to walk them through that and to allow them to understand what's going to happen and what to do if they have a problem. Um, the way one of our participants put it was if, if you treat it like a Zoom call, then it will feel like a Zoom call. Um, so we didn't do that, at least we thought later on not to do that and and to make sure that it, people understood the, the, the um, the format that they were in and what was expected. Um, we found that the layout of the screen was important. It sounds like a small point, um, but it, it was really important um, that the judge could be seen by everybody. It was less important that the jurors had prominence. Um, and what we know from a pilot summary trial that's been conducted in Scotland is that, that they ran into problems there by not um, designing the screen in a way that they could control um, who appears where. Um, so it's a small point, but one of importance. Um, we found that court dress and the backdrop was really important. Um, in our earlier trials, we paid less attention to this, and it made a real difference to um, how people felt about it. If people are joining from their home, um, or potentially from an office, but not attending a court, um, 
it became clear that actually court dress, whilst it may seem slightly ridiculous to the person in their um, in their home, actually made a huge difference. We've got a coat of arms, put it behind um, the judge. Small points like that can actually be really important in setting the scene. Equally in a different forum, less formal um, measures may be appropriate, but actually paying attention to that um, is is uh, a finding that of, of importance. Um, in terms of the experience, um, one of the main feedback points was that the virtual courtroom appeared to facilitate a greater sense of participation than an actual courtroom might. In Instead of re rendering people more remote from each other, which you might wonder it would do because they're geographically remote, in fact, it seemed to make people seem uh, feel as if they were less remote. Um, it created a sense of intimacy because everyone is there on the screen um, and you can see everyone clearly. That's not always true in a courtroom. In fact, it's often not true. It's very rare to be sitting in one part of a courtroom and actually to be able to see the face of all the different players in the trial. Um, so there was a certain intimacy created there, um, which created a sense of cohesion, I think. Um, that also gives the potential to create a more equal and level playing field. Um, for example, the accused is simply another person in a box in a screen. It's not somebody sitting in the dock. Um, also manages the potential for the intimidation of people. Um, it's much more difficult to intimidate a person if everyone can see everything that's going on in the screen, um, or if you don't have a sight line that might allow you to connect with one person alone. It also seemed that jurors were more comfortable raising issues in this format than they might be in open court. Um, there were facilities um, by raising a hand or using the chat function where jurors could um, raise an issue if they had a a difficulty and they were more seemed more inclined to do that than um, the professionals who participated had experience of jurors doing in court. It's quite a thing to stop a trial in the middle of evidence to raise your hand as a juror and try and get the judges or the clerk's attention. Um, certainly I've rarely seen it done. Um, usually it's, I mean, jurors do the opposite. They wait until they're on the point of collapse, feeling unwell before they're prepared to do that. So, um, so that's a really interesting um, finding, I thought, that actually if someone's struggling to follow proceedings, there's a much better chance of um, making that clear. Um, we did identify a need for adequate and frequent breaks. Um, I think it's um, now becoming understood as more people are participating in events like this, that participating on screen is a lot more tiring and onerous than doing it in person. So that's something that needs to be taken into account um, in, in remote hearings. Um, biggest issues that I think we ran up against um, really were technical facilities and, and there's there's lots of stuff I could say about that but it's it's pretty boring if that's your area and you're interested then please do access um, all the evaluation reports that are on the just justice website um, but but you know generally speaking um, I think as one of the previous speakers made clear any of these hearings can only be effective um, if the if the technical um, ability for them to be effective is there. And if you can't see someone's face, then it's really hard to see how you're going to effectively engage with them. So um, going forward, um, there's a few things that I think I can say about what opportunities this can present. Um, I think one big thing to say is that so far in terms of the work, um, what we have not sought to do in any way is to take account of people who have who have issues of any kind, whether that's vulnerability in a general sense or a mental health issue. Um, and it seems to me, um, as someone who's engaged in this work, and actually I, I was counsel um, contributing to the um, Equality and Human Rights Commission work on mental health and the accused, um, there needs to be a way of identifying accused persons and, and witnesses indeed, who would struggle in that format if, if there's any move to use it with any regularity. Um, and I think one of the clear findings from the report um, that the Commission did was that the system is poor at highlighting um, those persons that need help. Um, it relies on it being spotted and, and there's not very many safeguards in the system um, to always do a check. So I think 
one thing for all of us campaigning on these things to try and do going forward is that if there was to be a move for trials or even in any virtual hearings that there is a step in the process that asks the question is this person suitable for this type of hearing and it's a, a box that must be ticked yes or no it's a step in the process that can't be ignored and i think if we we can see from from well lots of evidence that if it relies upon um, as John says, you know, inadequately trained lawyers um, or police officers to spot something, then, then many, many things will go unspotted. So I think it, it needs to be embedded in, in remote hearing systems that consideration is given to the appropriateness for this particular person or, or witness or whomever it is. Um, but I think it does present some opportunities. Um, I think it's, it's already been um, recognised within certainly the criminal justice system that giving evidence remotely can alleviate the, the stress and the pressure um, for witnesses. Um, and it seems to me that this maybe gives the opportunity for that same protection to be afforded to an, ac to an accused person. Um, so at the moment, if an accused person is vulnerable um, um, but, but needs to give evidence in their case, there's no provision for it. Um, helping that accused person, whereas in a virtual format, um, they too would be able to be in a room on their own um, and potentially have the sort of support um, in terms of a person being with them, um, for example, that a, a vulnerable witness is offered um, in, in a much better developed part of our system. Um, the other thing that um, was an interesting finding from the virtual trials was um, the ability of the accused to consult with their solicitor or counsel. Um, within the format, we set up a, a virtual room, a side room, um, where counsel and the accused could consult privately. Um, and there was a sense that the accused was um, more willing to do that and felt more able to do that, um, where it was simply a question of, of raising their hand in a virtual format, rather than this is kind of the same example as the jurors if an accused person wants to speak to their lawyer in the middle of proceedings they kind of have to wave from the dock or shout across the room and um i think you've really got to feel like you've got something very important to say to do that um it's it's far from ideal and in in this format though it's if you if you just raise a virtual hand and the judge spots that and can just quietly pause proceedings whilst you go off to your virtual room that may offer and more of opportunity, particularly to those accused who need extra support and to find that support without waiting till the end of the day um, to speak to the lawyer about something. Um, it, it also speaks to a presumption of innocence point, um, but the point I was making earlier, um, the, the accused is not sitting in the dock in a virtual format. Um, so um, justice has done a um, a report on this about the, the prejudice that um, is presented when an accused person starts off a trial, um, apparently with their presumption of innocence, but, but sitting in the dock. Um, so um, it's, it, it, evens, it evens that out. The accused is just another, is just another person um, presumed to be innocent for the duration of the trial. Um, and I think it also presents an access to justice opportunity. Um, and, and this is true for all remote hearings. Um, at the moment, if you want to access justice, um, you can, of course, you can go to a court um, and, and sit in it, but um, very few people do, as um, most practitioners will know, there's not um, lots of people, members of the public, just um, idly sitting and watching proceedings. Whereas if you were interested in a case um, and you could join remotely from your desk, um, simply by signing up in some format, then it seems to me that that represents a real access to justice opportunity in a very wide sense um, uh, and particularly um, for those persons for whom turning up physically presents a problem whether that's as a result of a physical disability or a mental health issue or, or whatever it may be that there are people who would be more able to or more inclined to access justice if they were able to do so um, remotely so that seems like another opportunity. Um, so that's it. I don't want to talk much longer. We're already eating into Q&A time, so I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks very much, Catherine. That's really uh, interesting stuff. Um, can I ask all of our panel to switch their videos and audio 
on, or at least your video for the moment, and I've put it into a panel format where hopefully everyone uh, can see all of our panellists. I'm hoping this is going to work. <laughs> I can certainly see you all, so that's a good start. <clears throat> can I ask also, if people are asking questions, can you make sure that they're being sent to the panellists so that we have all of them um, to hand, um, if that is okay? Um, I should say as well, I know people have been asking in the chat, we are recording this and yes, that will be um, available afterwards, tech um, permitting. Um, it does seem to be recording at the moment, so that should work, I'm hoping, and we'll send you links to that. Um, a question then for, for our panel, um, as technology is ever increasing and hearings are happening more online, and presumably will continue to be in the future, what do you think would be the most crucial aspect of current remote hearings that need to be improved to ensure um, that everyone's right to fair trial is adhered to. So the most crucial aspects that need to be better um, if we're going to continue with remote or extend remote hearings. John, maybe can I start with you? Sure, of course. Um, I, I think maybe we, we, we as the at least some of us as the lawyers in the cases need to be uh, more uh, in tune with the the party, the accused person, and to make sure that there's a responsibility, I think an increased responsibility on us to make sure that they understand before a hearing exactly what's going to happen. And if it's procedural hearings, then I I, I don't I, I know I've, everything I've said really sounded pretty negative about it. With procedural hearings, uh, there's a lot to be said for it. Um, you know, the, a, a hearing that might take five or ten minutes, and people are being brought from prison in in Aberdeen or Inverness. So, to to avoid that, that that's fair enough. But you need to make consultation with them beforehand, preferably face to face if you can to say this is what's going to happen, do you have any questions? And then to speak to them and say, right, did, did you follow everything that was going on or do you have any questions? And I think when it comes to evidential hearings, although that's happened, uh, as we've heard, and that there have been summary trials that, that where uh, there's been a remote element to it, uh, I, I think that should be avoided. I think th there's there's certainly plenty of scope for using them for procedural hearings, and that could speed things up. But even then, one of the examples and questions that I think Fiona uh, had posed was about bail hearings. Now, a bail hearing might be the most important hearing that that, that person has, uh, and if that if the person's going to be at the police station, uh, and if the person may not have seen the solicitor beforehand, uh, other than by video link. Uh, the, they may well come away, and as, as another panelist pointed out, was bail refused and be completely in the dark about it. And that that is part of the experience referred to in the HRC report. You know, somebody coming out saying, "What the hell happened to me there?" And they, they they've got the headline, but none of the detail, and they're entitled to all of it. Thank you. Me, do you have any particular thoughts? What would improve the systems that we have now? Well, I suppose I have to say the obvious, which is that the technology, um, you know, we need to make sure that the technology is constantly being examined and improved as much as possible. I've, I've mentioned the importance of maintaining sensory hearing principles throughout remote hearings. So, for example, there's just a much just a small, small pause between what I can see and what I can hear uh, on the screen at the moment. Uh, and for someone with a sensory um, disability or someone who has a, an auditory processing um, condition, that just might be a wee bit um, challenging. Uh, so I think that, uh, and I've seen the difference even in the last few weeks in terms of the steps that we're starting to take to improve um, some of the uh, technology. And it, 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 it's clear it can be done, but I think that we have to, we have to improve it as much as we possibly can and keep improving it constantly as we learn more. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, Catherine, any comments you want to make on that question? 
sorry, was that for me? Uh, yeah, if you have any, yeah. Yes, I mean, I think um, preparation, as Catherine said, for the specific situation that you're in, recognising that preparation for an immigration case is different from a criminal case and preparation for a bail hearing is different from an asylum case. And I noticed on the chat, there was a comment from, um, I think, Melissa saying that, uh, you know, th there had been suggestion that an asylum hearing could take place with the individual in the solicitor's office. And, you know, you're saying, well, it, the loss of the feeling of being in court, the loss of being co-present, if that's going to be our reality, you need to prepare really well so that people have the same opportunity to, to par participate. Um, and, that, and that requires, as I said earlier, thinking about where the interpreter is, thinking about what the interpreter is doing, giving them time and confidence to do their job and keeping communication front and centre. Thank you. Do you want to add to that? Yeah, I think just slightly reiterating things that have been said, but it, it, the business of being able to, to indicate that there's a problem. Um, so that was a positive, obviously, as I've highlighted from the trial, but that was only because provision was made for that. And then I think what we're highlighting in all of the comments is that whether if you're an accused person joining from prison or, or whatever your situation is, how do you indicate that you didn't hear something, that you didn't understand it? Um, whether that's to the court or the forum or to your representative, there needs to be some ensuring that there's a channel there so that someone can raise their hand and say there's a problem. Thanks very much. Um, we've been asked, uh, there are obviously an ability uh, now for vulnerable witnesses or children to give uh, um, evidence by video link. Um, do any of our presenters know um, how that is being received presently by judges? Um, or the council agents and, and jurors or parties and other lessons from that um, that might be learned. Um, and along with that, I see somebody's asking whether hybrid hearings might be a way forward, which I suppose is a bit the same kind of thing, some video evidence, some live. Um, Catherine, do you want to start us? Sorry, my sound cut out just at the very beginning of the question. What was the first sentence of the question? <laughs> Sorry, um, the fact that there already are uh, is video evidence available for vulnerable witnesses um, and children. Do you know how that's working in practice? What is the judges and other parties' views of how that works? Um, so I don't have direct experience of that. I think it's quite mixed. Um, I think John probably would be better placed because it's mostly in a criminal format that that takes place. So I think I'll defer to John on that. John, any thoughts? Absolutely, yeah. I, I think uh, I think mixed hearings like that is probably uh, going to be a feature. And I, I think you, some of the trials that they've had so far, element. I, I think there may have been the the witnesses. So I think other parties were were gathered. Uh, so I, I think that will be a feature. And in terms of how that's received by the fact finder, whoever the fact finder is. Um, I, I mentioned in response to the, the question uh, some research that James Chalmers had been involved in, uh, and uh, so far as impact on juries was concerned. And while instinctively I, I thought that uh, it was probably going to dilute the impact on juries, I, I think I, I've not reread it, but I think some of uh, James's findings or his colleagues' findings w were to the effect that actually it didn't really make that big a difference with juries. And I think so far as sheriffs and, and judges are concerned, if they were the fact finders, um, I, I think they, they would understand that, you know, evidence on commission is in particular with a child or a, a vulnerable witness, which is certainly something that they're they're trying to expand the use of and putting the disc in. And that's that's the evidence and the, the witness has long since finished giving their evidence months or years before. That that's now such a, a normal part of the, the system that uh, the, the, whoever the fact finder is, I think will 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 uh, will cope with that. Thank you. Does that happen much in the ASNTS? Me, do you do remote witness evidence um, in that kind of setting? Yes, I, I think in some ways tribunals are more used to the concept of um, hearing evidence and, and using different means. 
just before lockdown, we had um, a hearing where expert evidence was being heard from a number of countries across the world. Um, and it was all being taken using video link. And we also encourage children, either child parties or children, children will always be the subject of the hearings or, or young people, but we encourage them to use a range of different means when it comes to participation. And it's not uncommon for children themselves to pr prepare a video or uh, or for a video to be prepared that's lodged, so it's not in real time. Because you made you made something about you made a comment at the beginning, Lynn, about um, one aspect not being live. When we're talking about video link evidence, it's all in real time, so it's all part of the live hearing experience. Um, so we're used to children. Uh, we're used to to having children's views set out in in video form and lodged with us and um, taking evidence using video link or taking evidence by telephone is something that's that's very much familiar in the territory of tribunals. Thanks for that. Um, Sarah, anything to add from the immigration perspective? I was actually just responding to a point that John had made about not realising that errors have happened. And I think this is where audio recording can, can help in the immigration setting to um, check errors in translation, which you're meant to notice at the time. But clearly, if you don't know that they've happened, how do you do that? Um, now, I'm not suggesting that that should be done in every single hearing that happens, but I think it's certainly something that could at least be thought about. Um, I think I think it all comes down to the technology being good. To go back to the point about hybrid hearings, um, a bail hearing in, in an immigration setting is precisely that. And it's a bit different from the asynchronous situation where the wit witness's evidence has been recorded prior to that and then it's you know heard later. Um, and, and it comes down to the technology being good. If you're trying to even out this feeling of exclusion and, and avoid it. Then that is, yeah, you know, that is so important. Thank you, and Lynn. Just briefly, yes. uh, the, the very that took place, um, a conviction appeal which took place remotely, um, the the technology failed, and it was the the Lord Justice General who disappeared and missed some of the hearing. I had to come back and say to Lord Turnbull, um, what, "What did I miss?" In effect, um, so uh, you know. It, the technology genuinely is a, a, a real issue. And the other thing is, one of the, back on the question about things to uh, be careful about, um, if your face is taking up the whole screen, you need to be very careful about your facial expressions, as one senior judge has not yet learned, who's got an extremely expressive face. It's very expressive when you're in the courtroom with this person, but when this face is, is taking up the whole screen, you know when uh, patience has disappeared. <laughs> a very good point for all of us, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, Fiona McKinnon um, has asked um, what our views might be on uh, the fact that there's an agreement um, between the police service, Scottish Court Service and Sheriff Principals in Glasgow to pilot a remote representation for custody cases, starting, I think, with domestic violence cases. Um, without consulting defence agents, it would seem to start that up. Um, they have genuine concerns around human rights compliance and effective participation. Um, does any of our panel have a view on whether there are difficulties with that? Well, well th there are because it's been, it has been said before that the trial starts in the police station, so it actually goes back to effective participation then. And there have been concerns for a while, and when I was involved in Justice Scotland, it was a concern. A very, very high percentage of people who who waive the right to legal representation may, on the basis of misconceptions, misunderstandings of how long it would take and that would cost them money and so forth, and, and right through to the trial. And I'm reminded of an appeal which was successful against conviction, where uh, the QC for the the appellant uh, said he was okay with the appellant being left out in a corridor while some point was raised, and the decision of the appeal court was that that the person 
was effectively excluded from part of their own trial. Now, that could, with technology, that can happen in different ways. And if it happens in a significant aspect, then there is the potential for uh, for an appeal based on the fact that you you were not able to fully participate in part of your trial. So it, it is a it is a concern on the the point about discussions. The courts, to my mind, sat for quite a long time. Scottish courts and tribunal service sat for quite a long time waiting for things to change. As I suppose did did we all to some extent. Uh, and relatively recently, there's been quite a lot of activity. Not sure that it's it's been as exhaustive as it as it probably should be, um, but it, it, you know we're now I think been told all the courts are going to be back running from from uh, today or tomorrow, uh, and I, I would just rather worry that the 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 uh, backlog is driving things in a way that, for example, saying no, I, I want my client to be here for this hearing, or or actually my my video link's not working is just going to. Uh, be kind of ridden roughshod over by an extent if we're not very careful and if we as practitioners are not prepared to say no stop now uh, because the, the the some of the senior judiciary are thinking we've got a five-year backlog here what are we going to do and that isn't in the context of any individual case the backlog is irrelevant it's that case that matters we need to be aware of that as practitioners thank you um, we only have a few minutes left so one last question if i could um, do any of the panel have thoughts on the impact of economic disadvantage on an individual's ability to participate in remote hearings in terms of actually having access to technology, um, hardware, internet connections, that kind of stuff, especially if they're trying to participate from home? Um, is that going to be a difficulty going forward? May have you experienced any of that in your um, area? It's, it's something I have a real concern about, and it's not something that I've actually um, experienced very much of. I have had a case where the uh, appellant didn't feel able to participate effectively in a telephone hearing because um, the impact of lockdown was such that the appellant had responsibility for other children who made up the family and uh, childcare uh, couldn't be put in place and the whole um, the whole prospect of engaging in any type of hearing to be frank but in a telephone hearing was just um, very difficult. Now, that's not really a, an economic disadvantage. That's a disadvantage that would impact anyone during lockdown, although I am aware that in this particular case there would have been an economic disadvantage as a component. But, but I do have concerns about that overall, and I can think of a number of um, cases in the past where this would have been a real concern, uh, which is why I'm not promoting a single um, type of remote hearing as being a one size. That's why I'm not promoting a one size fits all. So, for example, a video conference hearing for someone uh, with uh, limited access to technology might be out with um, their gift, whereas a telephone hearing might well be within their gift because most people have um, telephones. Uh, the majority of uh, part, part of the work that we did with children and young people, we identified that the majority of children and young people um, with sensory difficulties access technology using their smartphones rather than PCs and Macs. So um, we would be fairly comfortable expecting that children themselves would be able to access uh, hearings with with a with a telephone, but I don't I don't know that that's I don't think that I'm answering this as well as I would want to because I think that if somebody wants to attend a hearing using video technology, then they ought to be able to do that, and it ought not to be the case that because socially disadvantaged that they're prevented from doing it. So I think this is part of the learning on a continuum for me. And I think that means that we have to find answers to that. Is there a way in which we can resource someone to be able to attend a video remote hearing, even though by their own resources they wouldn't be able to do that? 
Thank you, Perry. Um, I'm afraid we've just run out of time unless anyone has a, a pressing last comment that you'd like to make from our panel. <laughs> Can I just say thank you so much um, for joining us today? Um, and John, you managed to type and talk at the same time. I'm so impressed um, in our chats. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, please, um, everyone who's still around, please do give us feedback. And this is our first attempt um, at this. I'm sure there's a lot of learning that we can take from it. Do feel free to tell us what didn't work for you or what we can do better on it. Um, and thank you specifically to John, Sarah, me and Catherine um, for joining us today and participating. It's been really, really interesting. Um, thank you for your time. <laughs>